Um, okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. Uh, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, tonight we're going to talk about the Buddha's brother-in-law. <laughs> so tonight we're going to talk about somebody named Devadatta, who happens to be the Buddha's brother-in-law. But before we start talking about that, let me kind of remind everybody, in case you kind of haven't been coming, or just to kind of establish why, why would we talk about the Buddha's brother-in-law. Um, so I actually, I want to start by mentioning that I, I know that the Dharma Doors has drifted, you know, into this world where we've been talking about this sutra for a while. So we've been doing a good sutra study. But the sutra has drifted all over the place. This has, you know, been a very interesting sutra. And I mentioned this weeks and weeks and weeks ago, which is that I wanted to do this sutra not so much because of like the ideas that are in it, <clears throat> excuse me, the ideas that are about upaya, about skillful means, they're very interesting ideas. But I actually wanted to do this sutra, I wanted to talk about this sutra because it, it has in it so much Buddhist culture. And so what I mean by that is, is that there's all, you know, there's a whole, like, of course, a, a mythology, a cosmology, a whole history, a whole culture that sort of surrounds the world of Buddhism. And that culture is very rich. And there's a way in which if you understand the history and the culture and all of these ideas, it will lend to your understanding of like the deeper ideas, like to the Dharma. And then that, of course, informs our practice. So I, you know, I just, this is sort of an interest of mine to delve into these little worlds and one little world of Buddhism is a discourse about the Buddha's brother-in-law, this, this guy named Devadatta. So this story of Devadatta, it comes to us in our sutra. Remember, we've been reading <clears throat> the Upaya Kushalya Sutra, the Skillful Means Sutra. And lately, the last... Mm, six or seven dharma doors we've been talking about these unfortunate events that happened to the buddha and there are 10 in this sutra there are 10 unfortunate events and this is the last one this is the final kind of big unfortunate event that happens to the buddha and this will actually be the last part of the sutra we will spend one more Sunday night on this sutra, so next Sunday, but that's going to be kind of a grand recap where I want to kind of go over the sutra as a whole, because I know when we when we go through it this slowly, we can kind of forget, <laughs> where did this start? Why are we talking about this again? <laughs> so that'll be next week. So let's dive into this Devadatta character. So. Let's start where I kind of always wind up starting, which is the language. I want to talk a little bit about the language, a little bit about the, the meaning of this person's name. So Deva Datta. So Datta, the second part of this person's name, Datta is related to the Sanskrit word Dana. So you know, I know you know the word dana as a giving or generosity. So etymologically related to dana is data, which is a gift. Makes sense. Very related that sense that way. So data is a gift that you would dana that you would give in that way, and then a deva is the Sanskrit word for a god. And so the word devadatta means gift 
of the gods, gift of the devas. Really quickly, just because this just recently came up, um, it, it came up in some other thing, and I don't know where else I would share this, so I wanted to share it with you. I recently learned the deeper etymology of this Sanskrit word deva. So deva is, you know, this Sanskrit word that would mean like a divine being or a heavenly being. But what I didn't know is that that word deva goes over to kind of the Western world, to the Greek and, you know, Latin speaking world. And it is from deva, the Sanskrit, that we get the word deus, which in, in Spanish you might know dios, God. So the Latin deus, dios, all of those words for God come from this Sanskrit word deva. What I just learned recently, though, that kind of blew my mind, so I wanted to share it with you, it's not really related, but it kind of is. I didn't realize that the god Zeus, <laughs> that the word Zeus is Dios. The Z and the D are etymologically basically the same letter. And so the word Zeus is from this kind of root word, God. So I didn't realize that Zeus isn't just a God. <laughs> Zeus is like, granddaddy god and of course in the greek mythology he is so just an interesting interconnected world of this word for a god but of course in sanskrit deva is a god not the god in that sense so just a little etymological fun on the side so who was devadatta who was this person so I've already mentioned that this was the Buddha's brother-in-law. So how we get there is that, as you may know, the Buddha, which I actually I should say, Siddhartha Gautama, the, the, the being, the human that was born and became a Buddha, Siddhartha, as you may know, grew up in the palace, grew up in the, the, you know, the palace of his father, the king, King Sudhodana. And eventually Siddhartha gets married and he gets married to a woman named Yashodhara, Yashodra. And Yashodra's brother was Devadatta. And so this is how Devadatta became the brother-in-law of the Buddha. He's also the Buddha's cousin, kind of once, you know, removed kind of over here, but he's kind of more famously known as being the Buddha's brother-in-law. So what happens is, is this, as you know, from the story, the Buddha eventually, or Siddhartha, renounces, renounces, renounces the throne, renounces princehood, renounces the palace and goes off into the woods. And out in the woods, he performs the austerities for six months. And you might recall that was one of the unfortunate events that happened to the Buddha, which is that he had to undergo all these austerities. And then he eventually becomes an awakened one, a Buddha. And then he goes back to the palace and he basically tells all of his family members, he tells his father, his, his, his aunt, he was raised by his uh, maternal aunt, I think, Prajapati, and he gets all of these fam family members to renounce as well. He gets his, his uh, aunt who raised him, he gets his cousin Ananda, he gets his brother-in-law, Devadatta, he gets his barber, Upali. He gets uh, a bunch of people from, he gets his wife, Yashodra, his son, Rahula. They all renounce the palace. The, they actually renounce the household life. And it's only his father who 
is like thanks but no thanks so pretty good pretty good for the buddha on that and so it was with that initial flock of relatives which again includes ananda and upali and all of these other people that devadatta goes and becomes a bhikshu becomes a follower of the buddha now an interesting aspect and i want to tell you these little details about devadatta because it'll all kind of come to the surface later on devadatta seems to have been known for a number of things but in terms of his early life as a monk as a bhikshu he becomes this like he becomes a symbol if you will or he becomes associated with the superpowers the siddhis but what he becomes known as is basically like somebody who just really wanted to develop superpowers like that was really kind of what he was interested in and so he did all the meditation and he did all the practices to develop the superpowers but he at least the story is is that he never made any efforts or any endeavors for what are called the transmundane attainments so the siddhis are these attainments these are signs of awakening they are signs of spiritual development but the spiritual superpowers are considered mundane attainments because they are sort of you know okay so you can walk on water but have you known the cessation of the taints <laughs> have you known the cessation of suffering that's a, a super or trans mundane accomplishment and apparently devadatta didn't care much about those but he was really interested in the superpowers and it really kind of starts to speak to this person's personality like that type of personality that's kind of in this in the spiritual game for those types of things so anyways this goes on for a while where david datta is like this kind of he's a fringe figure he's on kind of the edge we don't hear about him that much but then something happens and it's kind of this really interesting event and it happens oh i forget exactly when this is supposed to have happened i think it's sometime during sort of the the middle period of the buddha's teaching what happens is is that devadatta is very accomplished in these spiritual superpowers and eventually he starts to seemingly get this kind of ego to the point where during a public uh like a, a gathering of the entire sangha devadatta says buddha you should retire and put me in charge <laughs> and the buddha's like uh i wouldn't even put shariputra or madhulyayana in charge why would i put you in charge and this kind of public event where the buddha says no way would i ever make you like leader of the sangha this story says this sort of sets devadatta off where he now starts to plot against the buddha and he does this and there's there's different aspects to this story but one thing that happens that's kind of important to the whole history of buddhism devadatta it is said goes to someone named prince ajatta shatru now prince ajatta shatru was the son of king bimbasara and king bimbasara was the king of magadha and so you might recall that the region where the buddha is from is magadha 
this sort of region in northeastern India, or what we now today call India. So the king at that time was this person Bimbasara, but his son Ajatashatru wanted to be king. Devadatta wanted to be head of the Sangha, wanted to be leader of the Buddhists. So Devadatta starts buddying up with Ajatashatru. And eventually, Ajatashatru starts making these really um, very generous, very elaborate donations just to Devadatta. Not to the whole Sangha, not to the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the three jewels, but just to this person, Devadatta. And eventually, Devadatta starts to amass this kind of basically his own little clique, his own little group, because he had all of these like yummy foods and all of these nice clothes and all this stuff that were being given by Ajata Shatru. So eventually what happens is, is that Devadatta says to uh, Ajata Shatru, hey, why don't you kill your father and I'll take out the Buddha? And then I'll be put in charge of the Sangha and you'll be put in charge of Magadha. So they agree to do this. They agree to support each other in this plot. Now, on Ajatashatru's side, he does, or at least as far as the history goes, the account is that he does, he puts his father, Bimbasara, basically he locks him in this tower and he dies. So he doesn't like murder him exactly, but he basically does. And then Ajatashatru becomes king of Magadha. Meanwhile, Devadatta has a plan and he concocts this really elaborate plan, which is that he's, he hires this one person to wait at a certain place for the Buddha to come along. And then I think he was an archer and he was going to shoot the Buddha with arrows and murder him. That was the big plan. But Devadatta had an even better plan. He knew that it could never come out that he, Devadatta, was responsible for the Buddha dying. And so Devadatta hires another guy to kill the archer after the archer has killed the Buddha, thus kind of covering his tracks. But not only that, the story is, is that Devadatta hired another guy to kill that guy after he killed the archer. And then another guy to kill that guy to kill that guy. And, and then he created this kind of elaborate scheme to try to not get caught. But of course, what happens is, is that the very, very first archer who's supposed to actually kill the Buddha, the Buddha's walking along at the place that he was supposed to be walking along, and the guy is about to shoot him with the arrow, and the Buddha is just pure bliss, just pure loving kindness. And the archer, he can't do it. And so he doesn't kill the, the, the Buddha, and because that doesn't happen, the other guy doesn't have to kill him, and the other guy doesn't have to kill him, and the whole plan falls apart. <laughs> so that was Devadatta's first attempt at killing the Buddha. He makes a second attempt, and this time he is on the famous vulture's peak, the Gridrakuta. And at that time, he pushes a boulder down the hill, hoping that it would basically smash into the Buddha. He pushes the boulder, it rolls down, and of course, it comes nowhere near the Buddha, because it is basically understood to be impossible to harm a Buddha in that way. But, but the Buddha looks up and sees Devadatta and knows that it was Devadatta who pushed the rock. And the Buddha basically says, like, you're going to regret that. And not in like a warning way, 
but in a kind of karmic way of like, oh, I'm kind of sorry for it. I'm sorry that you went there because it's not going to end well for you because of that. But that didn't dissuade Devadatta. And so Devadatta makes a third attempt on the Buddha's life. And this is the most, the most famous of the attempts. The one, it's the one you hear about the most. And what it is, is that there was a famous elephant, a large famous elephant in Magadha named Nalagiri. Nalagiri. And one day, Devadatta knew that the Buddha was coming to town. And so Devadatta started feeding this elephant alcohol getting this elephant drunker and drunker and drunker until right when he was really, really drunk, the Buddha came into town. And that's when Devadatta startled the elephant, the drunk elephant. And this elephant just starts hurling towards the Buddha. And that was Devadatta's big plan is to have this out of control drunk elephant stampede over the Buddha. But of course, once again, the elephant's coming charging for the Buddha, and the Buddha just turns around and basically loving kindnesses the elephant. And the elephant stops dead in its tracks and basically, they say, bows down. So those were David Datta's three attempts at murdering his brother-in-law, the Buddha. After that, Devadatta takes a different approach. <laughs> and what he does is, is that after he's failed to do this, he decides, well, it's not exactly sure what his big plan here was, but at another public gathering of all of the Sangha, Devadatta makes a request of the Buddha. And he requests that the Buddha add five rules to the vinya, to the discipline. And the rules are that the monks, all the bhikshus and the bhikshunis, all the monks and all the nuns, that they should always basically dwell in the forest. They should never go in the city. Or like, basically, they should just always be hanging out in the forest. They should always beg for food rather than receiving invitations. I'm going to mention a little bit more about each of these. So let me just give you all of them real quick. He also suggested that all of the monks make their robes out of discarded material not new material, that the monks and the nuns should always only sleep under the shelter of a tree. And the fifth suggestion of Devadatta, interestingly, was that all of the monks and nuns should be vegetarian, should avoid flesh and fish. So, at a, this public gathering, Devadatta suggests that these should be added to the rules. And the Buddha basically says, no, the monks, they can do that if they want. Except, he says, I do not think that they should always sleep outside, un like under a tree. And this was part of the kind of the Buddhist, what became the Buddhist tradition under the Buddha, which was during the rainy season. So during three months of the rainy season, you could seek shelter, like sh proper shelter. And then during the rest of the time, yeah, then you sleep outdoors, sleep outside and all of that. So the Buddha says, the monks, you can do that if you want, but I'm not making those the rules. And I'm definitely advising that the monks do not sleep outside year round. After this, Devadatta splits off and he basically starts a schism. <laughs>
And this is what, you know, David Datta is famous or infamous for a few things. He's infamous for having tried to kill the Buddha. And he's also infamous for having created one of the first schisms in the Sangha. So he was still getting the support of King Ajatashatru now. And getting all of this private support, he started to just create his own Sangha and cr effectively created a, a sect, a schism of Buddhism. And he, of course, was claiming, we're the real deal. Those guys are not the real deal. We're the real deal. And he apparently got quite a following. And eventually, the following got so big that the Buddha heard about the fact that there was this kind of offshoot, this other group. And so he sent Shariputra and Madhulyayana, his left and right hand man, he sent them over to go check out what was going on. <laughs> and interestingly, or the, the story is, is that Devadatta thought that Shariputra and Madhulyayana had abandoned the Buddha and had come over to be followers of him. And so he was all happy that, that they had like defected and come over to his side. And so he asked Shariputra to give a Dharma talk. Not a good idea. Shariputra said, sure, I'll give a Dharma talk. And he proceeded to give this very, very long Dharma talk during which Devadatta fell asleep. <laughs> But all the other monks were listening, and you know, and just wrapped up in what he was saying. And basically, they all follow Shariputra back to the Buddha because they're like, oh, yeah, that's the real Dharma over there, <laughs> leaving poor Devadatta with just a few students. So, all right. So that's a quick kind of background story of Devadatta. I have much more to say. We also got to get to the sutra and all of that. But before we get to the sutra, before we kind of get to that, like, I want to focus just for a minute on these five rules that Devadatta suggested. And I want to dwell on them because I want to tell you about something and just mention a few other things. So these five rules are actually pretty interesting if you think about them. And they actually, they say a lot about like what was going on in Buddhism at this time. And so the first one about Devadatta suggesting that we all, all the monks and nuns should always only dwell in the forest. So this one is kind of related to the second one, which was the rule about always begging for food. Now I know that you already know or I assume that you know that in the early Buddhist tradition, that was a rule that you had to beg for food. But there was, um, you know, there was something else that was permissible. And what it was, was that during the lifetime of the Buddha, as Buddhism started to get really popular, it became like a thing for very wealthy people, people of high status in India, it became a thing for them to invite the Buddha over to their house. And as we learned, this was a couple of nights ago, we, I told you a story about when the Buddha was invited over by a Brahmin and all the monks showed up, but then the Brahmin was having a party and he basically was like, eh, I don't care about the Buddha anymore. But that was a situation where normally a very wealthy person like that would invite the Buddha and the, the congregation, the Sangha, they would invite them to their land and basically put them up, like let them stay on the land, let them hang out, give them food. So they were receiving food as offerings, but because they had been invited to this person's house, they didn't need to beg for it. And this would be where they would actually stay at a person, like a wealthy person's property 
they would stay for weeks, maybe even months. And so that would be a week or even a month in which the monks were not just wandering around the forest, but had actually sort of taken up residence for a while. And that was the first thing that Devadatta had a problem with, was that we weren't, we weren't being hardcore enough and just going off in the woods. And we weren't always begging. We were sometimes just being taken care of by these wealthy people. So Devadatta wanted to kind of nix both of those activities. Related to that, you, there's actually a kind of a relation between all of these. The third of, the, the third of them is about always using discarded clothes. Now, a really interesting thing about this, if you don't know, originally, like in day or like the first year of Buddhism or like the first year of the Buddha's teaching, the everybody was naked. You would go off in the woods, strip naked because you were you were not a being of the world in any way, and you weren't owning anything. So in the very, very early days, the prescription was just, you know, uh, nature child, just go running around the woods, right, in your birthday suit in that way. But there's a story about how there was this one monk who was really, really, um, what's that? There's a good word for it, very hairy. There's like a G-R-E word for very hairy, right? But this one monk was really, really hairy. And then one morning, it was like, it was, you know, dawn, it was just the very beginning of light. And this very hairy, very naked monk goes knocking on a woman's door, begging for food. The woman opens the door and goes, and, and you know, she faints, she like totally passes out. Word gets back to the Buddha that this happened. And the Buddha's like, okay, we're wearing clothes now. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to scare anybody. And so the Buddha said, go to the cemeteries, go find bodies that are going to be cremated or bodies that are just out in an open air burial. Take the scraps of clothes from those bodies, bring them back, tear them up, this was the original description. Tear up the clothing, dye them with saffron, dye them yellow or an orangish yellow, and then stitch them together in a kind of like, um, the, the prescription is to like, put them to put the clothes together in a kind of patchwork fashion. No, not like nice lines, not nice, you know, it was supposed to be rags. And so that was the original way that the Buddhists do, did it. But it seemed that over time, eventually people started making donations of textiles, of, of material to the Sangha. And these would be very nice materials. Now, there were rules. In, in the original vinya, in the original rules, there were rules against silk and a few other materials that the monks were not, the, the monastics, I should say, that they were not supposed to wear. But in terms of what they could wear, hemp, cotton, these types of things, I'm not exactly sure what the materials were. There were a lot of grasses, I know that, that they were weaving out of a lot of grasses, but the materials that were allowed, again, eventually they just started to get donations of these things. And then they started to make seemingly nicer robes. And this is where David Datta is like, no, we got to get back to our roots. We got to get back to the days when we went to the cemeteries and ripped up the dead people's clothes. So there was that. The fourth was about sleeping under a tree. And I already mentioned that it became standard that during the three-month rainy season retreat, they would build these kind of 
you know, kind of huts and sleep under the shelter of huts during the rainy season. Deva Datta was not into that. He thought that they should always be roughing it in that way. And then the fifth of these, that Deva Datta wanted them all to be vegetarian. And the Buddha said, they can do that if they want, but I'm not going to make it a rule. Now, as you've heard, you might have heard it from me, in the early days of Buddhism, during the lifetime of the Buddha, the monastics, they would eat, or they were instructed to eat, whatever was put in the begging bowl. The only rule was that if it was meat, it couldn't have been an animal killed for you, like in your honor. Like, oh, the monks are coming. Let's slaughter an animal and feed them the meat. It had to be truly leftovers. That was sort of the main rule. Devadatta apparently wanted to make it a rule that they would avoid meat altogether. But the Buddha said no. But you may be, of course, be aware that in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, there is a rule about vegetarianism. But that rule is not part of the Vinaya. The, it's not part of the monastic rules. It's not part of the precepts. It's not part of the five precepts, the 10 precepts, or any of the lay precepts. The rule about vegetarianism is a bodhisattva vow. And you might know this, I've mentioned it in Dharmador's past, but in the Mahayana tradition, there are lay precepts, there are monastic precepts, which are these rules like, you know, no killing, stealing, lying, intoxicants, sexual misconduct, or sexuality at all, if you're a monastic. So there's precepts for laity, precepts for monastic. But then in the Mahayana, there is an additional set of bodhisattva vows that lay people or monastics can take. And they take these vows. Usually there's 48 of them. Lists will vary. But they will take these vows on top of the precepts. So it's sort of in addition to the precepts that you've taken. And again, I want to repeat that you take these vows either as a lay person or as a monastic. So, so the, the rule about vegetarianism cycles its way into the bodhisattva vows, but in the old school tradition, they stay the course of eating whatever is given to them. Of course, in Southeast Asia, where the Theravada tradition is still practiced, they will eat whatever is in the bowl. There's not a rule, to my knowledge, about vegetarianism in the Theravada tradition of today. Again, most Mahayana, all, the majority of Mahayana Buddhist traditions, which include the Zen Buddhist traditions of China and Japan, they're all vegetarian. But the Tibetans tend to eat a little meat. And this seems to be part of the fact that up in the Tibetan plateau, there's not a lot of choices. And so there was an adaptation of the rules to allow for meat eating and other things, uh, other things in the Tibetan tradition. So anyway, so from Deva Datta's like suggestions, you could read it, or you, it would sound as if Devadatta was trying to move the Sangha towards a more ascetic tradition. And the Buddha seems to have been holding the line on this middle path idea, where it was sort of was maintaining this sort of middle path regarding all of these precepts, regarding all of this uh, monastic behavior in that way. I do, the re only reason I wanted to kind of take you through all of that, in the Buddhist tradition, particularly the Mahayana tradition, there is something, or there are th things, 
known as duttas. So D H U T A, dutta. And then there is what is known as duttanga, the, the limbs or the factors of dutta. And dutta is translated as austerity. There's a list of 12 duttas, 12 austerities. And sleeping in the forest, um, sleeping under a tree, eating only one meal a day, all of these things, there's this list of 12 things that also are about wearing uh, discarded clothes, things like that. Those become known as the duttas. And what I want you to know, this has to do actually with the bodhisattva path in the Mahayana tradition. You know, because like I was just saying a moment ago, because the bodhisattva path, you can do it as a lay person, you could do it as a monastic. Like again, the bodhisattva path is above either of those two vehicles or either of those two paths. And what happens is, is that of course, if you are a lay bodhisattva, you're living in a house, you might have a job, you have regular clothes. So if you are a lay bodhisattva, you are not performing austerities. And then, as we noticed, even if you are a monastic, you are not wearing clothes from a cemetery, especially nowadays. Nowadays, monks and nuns, they have nice robes, like very nice robes. So to be a monastic is not an austerity in terms of the clothing, exactly. And you also, you know, usually sleep in a monastery, not out in the forest, not under a tree and all of that. So my point is, is that Eventually, in the Mahayana, at least, there's not a lot of austerities, definitely not by lay people and not by the monks or nuns either. But what happens in Mahayana Buddhism is it becomes a thing to practice the duttas. And then what that is, is that this is whether you are a lay bodhisattva or a monastic bodhisattva you might take a week or a month and go off and perform the duttas. So in the Mahayana tradition, it kind of becomes this optional, this optional thing to go off all by yourself into the woods and do it like they used to do it in a way, to kind of do the austerities in the old school style. But again, this was not considered a requisite. This was considered kind of optional in that way. So just want you to know that about those austerities, that those particular austerities, even the ones that Devadatta was proposing, they do become a part of the Buddhist tradition, but as these optional austerity practices. So. All right, that was quite a bit. Any questions, comments, or ideas about Devadatta, life story of the Buddha, austerities? Okay, then let's get down to business. So, yeah, actually, let's start with this. Let's get back to our uh, Ratnakuta Sutra collection. If you have the book, I'm on page 463. So once again, these are uh, uh, presented in the form of questions. Or actually, this one isn't quite yet. But what it says is, is this. Devadatta and the Bodhisattva which is to say the Buddha, Devadatta and the Bodhisattva have been born in the same place in every lifetime. 
This is also an upaya of the bodhisattva. This is also a skillful means of the Buddha. How so or why? Because of Devadatta, this is the Buddha talking, by the way. Because of Devadatta, I have fulfilled the six paramitas and benefited countless sentient beings. How can this be understood? Kulaputra, noble one. In a past age, when the Bodhisattva was a king, there were sentient beings who enjoyed themselves heartily, but they didn't know how to give or to whom to give. And the Bodhisattva, meaning the Buddha, wished to teach them the practice of dana, giving. Devadatta, who became jealous of the Bodhisattva, went to see him and asked for his capital city, his wife, his children, his head, his eyes, his hands, and his feet. The Bodhisattva, which is to say the Buddha who was a king in this former life, gave him all these gladly. At that time, incalculable numbers of sentient beings became cheerful and believed in and understood giving when they saw the Bodhisattva give in this way. They said, I will practice giving just as the Bodhisattva does so that I may attain awakening. All right, so let's hold off on that really quickly. So once again, there's something new going on here, which is that this sutra, our Upaya Sutra, is taking this classic story of Devadatta, the, the main points of which I've just told you all about, and it's taking that story, and just like it did with all the other stories, it's kind of turning it on its head, and it's saying, all of this was a big plan of the Buddha. As we're going to see, even Devadatta trying to take the Buddha's life, it was all part of the Buddha's big plan. All right. Now, this is sort of the main thing I wanted to say tonight. I, all of that other stuff was just because I don't, again, I don't know when else I would tell you all of that. But this particular story that we're hearing now about Devadatta, that, oh, no, 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 no. It's because of Devadatta, the Buddha says, that I fulfilled the paramitas. It's because of Devadatta that I cultivated the practice to save all these sentient beings. So I want you to know that that idea that Devadatta wasn't a bad guy, he was actually a good guy. I want you to know that that kind of revamping or that shifting of the story of Devadatta is most famously retold in the Lotus Sutra. So chapter 12 of the Lotus Sutra is the, Deva, the chapter on Devadatta. And it's in this chapter that we hear the same thing that we heard in, in our Upaya Sutra. And what that is, is that it was actually a good thing that Devadatta antagonized the Buddha because it was due to Devadatta's antagonizing that the Buddha was, had the impetus to cultivate the paramitas. So this becomes the, the new way to think about Devadatta. And what I'm getting at is uh, in terms of this new way of thinking about Devadatta. So in terms of the, like the life story of Devadatta and the Buddha that I just told you, where Devadatta tries to murder the Buddha multiple times, Devadatta becomes known as the enemy. And what I mean is, is like, he is considered like an enemy of the Buddha, but 
he becomes sort of symbolic of the enemy. <laughs> like whoever your en- or whoever you feel like your enemy might be, that's your Devadatta in that sense. And so what happens in this Mahayana version that we find in the Lotus Sutra and in our Upaya Sutra, it reflects this sort of uh, Mahayana mentality about enemies, about antagonism. And I want to actually, I don't usually do this, but there is a really good footnote in here. I think it's a good footnote. So it, yeah, I mean, I I basically just said it, but the footnote to part of this chapter, footnote 57, if you're looking, it talks about how, um, so David Datta, by his very malice, gave the Buddha such many opportunities to practice the paramitas and to set an example of virtuous patience and compassion for others. And it says, in Buddhism, enemies are considered to be greatly beneficial to one's dharma practice. So now Devadatta becomes this person who's greatly beneficial <clears throat> to the Buddha's practice, not the enemy exactly. And I wanted us tonight, like, again, that's sort of for me, like, the, the main takeaway for tonight is that idea of this kind of new Mahayana way of thinking about our quote-unquote enemies in that sense. And rather than seeing them as antagonistic in that sense, seeing that as an opportunity to practice, an opportunity to kind of rise to the occasion, an opportunity to take the higher path, all of that. And so if you look at it that way, and you're a good bodhisattva practicing loving kindness and compassion, then it's sort of a wiser, more skillful way to approach those who we would consider to be enemies in that sense. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about that idea, about skillfully doing that. Yeah, Noe. Yes. Be grateful for those who have been sent to teach you patience. <laughs> Excellent. That's exactly right. And, you know, we've talked about this sort of a little bit going back to last week, where the Buddha was being slandered and hurled all these insults in that way, but then was unaffected. Well, the same thing happens here, where the Buddha is antagonized by Devadatta and is unaffected. But then, I want to dwell just for a minute on this interesting, like, backstory. So this is new information. We've never heard this before, that Devadatta and the Buddha are born together every lifetime the two of them, right? And, you know, it's a very interesting idea that, it, it, for me, when I hear that, it, it starts to sound very archetypal in that sense, that it's, it's the archetypal relationship, you know? And, you know, it's really funny. I wasn't, I wasn't going to mention this, but I do, I, I want to mention it. it. Just on this note about like archetypal situations, so years and years and years ago, starting in 2006, wow, 2006, I started a nonprofit organization, a, a Buddhist nonprofit organization. I had big dreams. I had ideas of, of changing the world, right? And so I started this little nonprofit. And it got pretty big. This was uh, in California. And it got pretty big. It was doing pretty well. And then somebody else wanted to be in charge. 
<laughs> and somebody else suggested that I should step aside so that they could be in charge. And I thought, I've heard this somewhere before. I've, I've seen this has played out somehow before. And sure enough, this person, upon being told, no, I, I started it, I'm going to run it, was not happy with that and became antagonistic and created a schism and was taking donors. And it became this whole thing that is all too reminiscent of the Buddha's relationship with Devadatta. Now, I'm not comparing myself to the Buddha, but what I am saying is, is that this is an interesting story about like group dynamics. And when this all happened to me, and I, I knew about the story of Devadatta, and I was like, this, can, this is a little too weird. Does this always happen? And then I started thinking about the story of Judas Iscariot and this other kind of betrayer antagonist in that way. And it's almost like these religions are telling you, you know, once this gets going, <laughs> there's going to be schisms. And this is how they're going to play out. And this is why they're going to play out that way. So on the note of the archetypal nature of this, I was just wanted to share that with you all, that it may be that these patterns do repeat themselves all the time in that way. So, okay. So the reason why I wanted to mention that, or actually having mentioned that, let's get back. So we get this backstory about how Devadatta and the Buddha are reborn together every single time. And then the Buddha retells this past story of a, a, a prior lifetime in which he, the Buddha, was a king. And in that lifetime, lifetimes ago, Devadatta came to the king and asked the king for his capital city, his wife, his children, his own head, eyes, hands, and feet. And the Bodhisattva, meaning the Buddha, as the king in this prior lifetime, he gave, gave them all to Devadatta. And this becomes a kind of a theme, a theme in a number of Mahayana Buddhist sutras. It's a theme about giving, but about magnanimous giving. And what it is, is it's the story, or not the story, but it's this idea that if somebody comes to a bodhisattva and asks for their flesh, they get out a knife and give it to them. If they ask for their eyes, they pluck out their eyes and they give them to them. And I know that when I first started reading those parts of Mahayana sutras, where whoa, like that's what the Buddha, that's what the Bodhisattva is all about. Wow, like that's that's serious. And as I've kind of you know studied all of this and taught these sutras more and more, I've come to a kind of a very different understanding of all of that. You know, I used to think of it as, you know, kind of about, well, obviously about giving, but I used to think of it as a being about like, you know, <laughs> like real giving in that sense. And as I've thought about it and as I've taught it, what I've realized is Oh, the Buddhism, the Dharma has always been encouraging me to relinquish attachment to this physical body, relinquish attachment to all of this, not to be so clinging, grasping of it all. 
because the wisdom, the wisdom of the Dharma is that it is our holding on specifically to this body, our attachment to this body that is generating the anxiety and the fear about dying. It is, it is about like that we consider our body something that we own and then associate dying with losing that in that way. And so insofar as we are attached to that, and, and I know that you know your Four Noble Truths, and I know that you know that this clinging and this attachment is what is giving rise to the suffering. And so rather than reading these stories or reading these accounts, rather than reading them as, they, as these very macabre stories of people gouging out their eyes and giving it to other people, you can read it as a description of the bodhisattva being that unattached to their body. And in the same breath, at the same time that we are that unattached to the body, we are also that good at giving, meaning that we are that willing to give whatever is needed in that way. So when they talk about the bodhisattva giving their own flesh, giving their eyes, it's this twofold statement about the bodhisattva's non-attachment to their body and the degree to which they practice giving, to the highest degree of giving in that sense. So in the future, if you come across these parts of Mahayana sutras where they're talking about bodhisattvas giving up all of these things, just consider it kind of that way, if you will, or consider it. Okay, so that deals with our that part of it. Oh, and then of course, this really interesting idea that in that world, in that previous lifetime where the Buddha was a king and Devadatta asked for the king's body and all of that, it was because at that time, there were all these sentient beings who enjoyed themselves heartily, but didn't know how to give and didn't know to whom to give. And so that was when the Buddha created this upaya of having Devadatta come and ask for their own eyes and their flesh. And then everybody seeing the bodhisattva give to that degree is then they themselves motivated to give. So it was all a big upaya of the Buddha. Also, here on page 464, also, once, knowing that the bodhisattva kept the precepts purely, Devadatta tried to cause the bodhisattva to break the precepts, but the bodhisattva did not violate any one of them. When countless sentient beings saw the bodhisattva keep the precepts, they followed his example and did so themselves. The bodhisattva who kept the precepts, harbored no malice when he was despised, slandered, or reviled by others. At such times, he fulfilled the paramita of kashanti, of patience. And seeing the bodhisattva subdue his mind with such patient tolerance, innumerable sentient beings followed his example and practiced patient tolerance. Noble one, you should know that Devadatta has benefited the Bodhisattva greatly. All right, so I wanted to mention, so it mentioned at the beginning that it was because of Devadatta that the bodhisattva fulfilled the paramitas, 
And so you might not have caught it, but they are walking us through the paramitas here. So the first one was about giving. That's the first paramita and teaching the sentient beings how to properly give. Then the second paramita is about shila, moral discipline. And it was about how Devadatta tried to get the bodhisattva to break the precepts, but he didn't. So everybody was encouraged to follow the precepts. And then here, the third kashanti, the third paramita. This, of course, ties in with last week's talk about kashanti and this idea of kind of, you know, being despised, slandered, or reviled by others, but maintaining that patient tolerance in that way. All right. And noble one, recently, Devadatta tried to kill the Buddha by releasing a huge drunken elephant. He also pushed down a large boulder from the peak of Mount Gridrakuta for the same purpose. All these were manifestations of the Tathagata's upaya, not his karmic retributions. And why? Because these upaya would benefit numberless sentient beings. All right. And then just to conclude that part really quickly, noble one, the Tathagata has explained the causes and conditions of these 10 unfortunate events, which were all manifestations of the Buddha's upaya not karmic retributions. And why? Sentient beings did not know that karma brings about results. For their sake, the Tathagata manifested these karmic results and said, if you've done this karma, you'll get this result. If you've done that karma, you will get that result. Such and such a karma brings such and such a result. After hearing this, sentient beings would perform certain karmas and refrain from others. They would avoid evil karmas and cultivate good ones. Okay, so that leads me to kind of the final point that I wanted to make tonight. And it's sort of like a way to, a way to read all of this. Um, not just this last part about Devadatta, but sort of all of these 10 unfortunate events. So I wanted to mention really quickly, this is sort of a very, for, for me, this is like an old classic Buddhist teaching, but it fits in with the theme tonight. What it, for, so for me, the way that I read that, especially that last section there, that this karma, brings about that result, and this karma brings about that result. So the way that I understand a lot of that in terms of Buddhism is you take something like, what, what's an example? Well, it doesn't really matter. I'll, I'm going to choose something kind of benign, but this goes for everything in a certain sense. So let's think about a situation in which I have a, a, very, um, a very rich chocolate cake, all right? Now, the idea here is, is that I want you to think about a situation where I eat very quickly, because it's so good, the entire chocolate cake. And then that night, I get a stomach ache. What I want us to think about is that there is one way to think about that. And it would be kind of the normal way to think about these things, which is that, that a stomach ache is bad. It's, ba it's bad. Now, let's say I had one reasonably sized 
sliver of the chocolate cake. And it was delicious. <laughs> and it made my mouth happy. And my stomach was happy. We would call that good. What I want us to be thinking about from a, like a Buddhist point of view is taking the good and the bad out of this <laughs> and rather noticing that there is cause and effect, which is that if I eat the whole cake, it causes this feeling, this feeling of bloatedness, this feeling of nausea. Now, if you're into bloatedness and nausea, like if that's your thing, then you know how to get it. You know how to produce such a phenomena. Now, if you're not into bloatedness and nausea, you also know how to avoid that too. <laughs> what I want you to notice is, is that the, the bloatedness and the stomach ache, it's a consequence of the action of eating the whole cake. And calling it bad, that's kind of just a judgment versus recognizing that there is cause and effect. And there's also me eating just a little piece and the result of that. And I know how to get that then if I want that. <laughs> now, again, you don't have to call that good or bad, but it's about understanding cause and effect in that sense. Renata, did you have a comment or a question? Yeah, I guess I was curious why perhaps some of us might be slower learners than others, like repeatedly having to um, make the same mistakes, like over like mm -hmm. say feeling nauseous after a pint of ice cream but can you know you continue to go down the same aisle and look for <laughs> whatever ice cream you, and um even though you know the result so what what causes that i mean i can only speak generally in that way but what I, the, the basic Buddhist answer for something like that, of course. So there's one aspect of what we are talking about or what I'm talking about in terms of the eating the cake and then getting the stomach ache. One aspect of that is what we would call karma. But of course, all we mean by that is action. The action of eating the cake and then the karmic result of getting a stomach ache. So one thing that's going on, Renata, of, is karma, the action. You have asked about samskara, about conditioning, about a kind of why would we then go back to do that again and then again and again? And that's where I say, Renata, I can't say specifically why one would keep returning to that, because that would be a, you know, a deeper psychology for that person to look into. But the mechanism that is involved would be about conditioning. And what I mean by that, of course, is, you know, especially if you take food, Food is such an interesting one, as we, I hope, all know, you probably have thought about this, but it's the way in which food is so um, psychologically related, like in terms of like, you know, a lot of people, if they get lonely, will eat, and it's not because they're hungry, but there's, it's a kind of a coping mechanism, as they would say, for loneliness, or there's like a lot of different things going on with food in that way. I guess that was one thing that I, I almost, it almost seems to be the result. I sometimes wonder of, of when we talk about conditioning of say being raised by say television media 
commercials, you know, needing you, for some reason that cereal in the aisle was the best. And if you didn't get that cereal or, you know, you just, you know, your mom sucked or whatever. And, and that was like, you know, so if you like go, I, like, I sometimes wonder what was there before in my mind before the advertising <laughs> jingle. I mean, it's just, it, you know, so early and, and so that's kind of hard to get out of the conditioning because it was part of it. It goes back so early to the serial ads on during <laughs> television programming for kids. Um, yep. that's, a, that's one thing that comes to mind. Absolutely, Renata. Very related to what I was saying, especially like when it comes to sort of childhood things regarding food and then the way they manifest in adulthood. And the way that we might, you know, we might have a, uh, like that late, that late night bowl of cereal might be because of about the association with childhood and sort of this conditioned desire to go back to childhood. Like, again, we could, we could psychologize and analyze this all night. I don't want to do that. I'm not really equipped to do that or, you know, but in terms of looking deeper, just in terms of conditioned behaviors. And the idea here, and Renata, I really appreciate your question because it is one thing to eat a whole chocolate cake and then get ill as a result of that. It's another thing to do it again. Right? It's like, so Renata, you're right. That's a, that's a really good question of like the coming back for more in that way. And I would suggest that it's about conditioning in that way. Um, I mean, this is, you know, Renata, you and I have talked about this. I've talked about this in Dharma doors, but, you know, there are these uh, viparaya or vipalasa inversions, they're called. And there are these four inversions. And one of them, one of the four is mistaking suffering for pleasure. And I've mentioned that in my youth and my even my young adulthood, I often mistook suffering for pleasure in that I mistook drinking in excess to the point of being ill, I used to think that was a good time. <laughs> I don't know how I ever thought that was a good time, but I know my thinking was inverted back then, that the stomach ache and vomiting of drinking in excess, I went back for more. <laughs> Why? Because I was confused, because I was inverted in that way. So, Renata, you're, the Buddhist answer to your question of why would we would go back for more is inverted thinking. Why would, be, why would we have inverted thinking? Due to conditioning, due to samskara in that way. And part of the conditioning, just to bring this back around, part of the conditioning is labeling things as good and bad. That's like another layer of conditioning in that way. And again, that's where you can get in the inverted habit of labeling something as good, a good time when it really wasn't. But if you keep labeling it as a good time, then when the weekend rolls around and you want to have a good time, your mind is going to think of what you have come to associate with a good time, which might be inverted in that way. So thus, my kind of suggestion to look at the underlying karma of it all. And by karma, I mean the cause and effect. This causes that. And we don't need to call it good or bad. We can just notice relationships in that sense. So any other questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Yeah, Noe. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Renata, too. Uh, I just, at that time, innumerable sentient, number of sentient beings became cheerful and believed and understood giving 
when they saw the blue sofa given this way. Innumerable. This stood out for me because even now, in my lifetime, I'm one of those innumerable beings from this teaching thousands of years ago, that, I, that it's still being cultivated, that sentient beings are still being you know, reached out to and, and you know, practicing and awakening. So it's, it's funny that you know, he says it right there, but it's actually happening right now. It's just a small comment I wanted to make. That's an excellent comment. I, I, I love those kinds of comments, Noe. That the, and of course, Noe, you know this, I think everybody here knows this, but you know, my feeling about sutras is you know, that they are inviting us to be a part of them in that way and not to just be passive readers, but to understand that we are participants. And Noe just pointed out a kind of a little you know, a little aspect of the language there, these innumerable sentient beings, which indeed, insofar as this class tonight and this reading tonight, insofar it has affected us and affected our giving, then we're part of the innumerable sentient beings. So nice. On that note, I'm going to call it a night. I think, uh, yeah. Unless there's any other comments. Cool. Then that'll be it. Um, no, any anything we should know about? Anything I should mention? Well, I do have a thing, but first I want to do the usual things, which is uh ask you, Michael. First, thank <laughs> you for this wonderful teaching. My pleasure. Ask you if if you have anything that you want to mention coming up. Um, yeah, I have a few things. So I do have two uh, classes that I'm going to offer this summer. One class is going to be on the 10 Bodhisattva stages. It's going to be a 10 week class. Each week's class will look at one of the stages. That's going to be a class that's going to start on, let me see, June 29th and it'll go until August 31st. And then I'm also gonna offer a eight week class on emptiness. And this is for me like a fundamental, basic essential class that it's like, you know, just on emptiness. And it's kind of an eight week deep dive into that teaching. It's based on a poem by Nagarjuna. So that class is starting July 8th, and it's going to go till August 26th, I think, my eyes see. Um, and all of this information will be on my website shortly. I'm trying to get my website updated. Uh, so you'll hear more about this later, but those are the dates and those are the classes. And then in July, I'm coming up to the Bay Area, and I'm going to do an in-person workshop, a Dharma Doors workshop at the SFDC on 24th, 23rd, uh, 23rd that's right, sorry, <laughs> you no, no, it's on 24th Street, we're on 24th Street, oh, oh, I thought you meant July 23rd, <laughs> okay, yeah, I was like, wait, when it's, did you move, so, okay, it's July on 23rd, Street, and it's on July 23rd, <laughs> on 24th Street, and It'll be a three hour workshop and we're going to do a uh, just one sutra and it's a sutra on right view, but it's also a sutra on the 12 link chain of causation and a lot of ideas. So, uh, and then Noam and I will have information about that up soon, uh, but that's the date and that'll be from one to four. Uh, 